those individual personality variables are going to change what is or isn't traumatic to a person. got back uh what day is it saturday got back about six days ago just kind of getting settled back in how about you i'm uh i've been working like a dog actually i'm excited i uh i'm going camping next weekend so i'm like pretty stoked for that okay. i loaded up this week so i could just get everything done and uh it's gonna be pretty wicked man how was your vacation it was um so <laughs> it was good we're kind of calling it like the luckiest unlucky vacation, if that makes sense. Like a lot of not great things happen, but they all could have been way worse. So like um, third day we were there that night, right around midnight, it was a pretty bad storm and we lost power, which up, I mean, it's not that big a deal up there. The only thing we really use electricity for is the fridge, honestly, like that cabin doesn't have AC. We don't watch TV. So it's really just food. Um, so we weren't too stressed about that. But then when we woke up the next morning, we realized that the reason we'd lost power is that one of the trees on our property had fallen on the power line and also blocked our driveway. <laughs> and Damn. the drive, it, it's like, it's kind of up on a hill and the driveway is like dug into the hill. So there's, there's no way to get a vehicle in or out of there if that driveway is blocked. So we were stuck in, like, we couldn't. We had no power, so the food was going bad, and we couldn't go to the store, <laughs> so that wasn't great. Um, but they cleared that tree. The road department up there cleared that tree after like eight hours or something, so that wasn't too bad. We got power back two days later, but you know, then we were able to go to. We just basically spent a couple of days in town, which is like half an hour away, um, and then two days after that, we got a flat tire. But we happened to be in town when it happened, which is a miracle. You know, we could have been four miles down some gravel road in a national forest. You know how it is in those types of areas. So all the bad things that happened happened in pretty good ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, man. I've been there with the flat tire on. We call them like forest service roads up here. But like, Yep, I, that's same. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've been screwed on a forest service <laughs> road before, man. And Mm -hmm. it, it was pretty brutal i had yeah I had an experience like that but that's crazy man it would with the tree coming down too like so they they cleared that up for you after eight hours man that that must have been like a stressful eight hours though it was because i've like it, it's weird because we used to live up there in the summers so i mean i've spent months and months of my life up there and like somehow none of those things have ever happened before like, I don't remember, I'm sure we probably have lost power, but I don't remember it. We never got blocked in. I don't remember ever having car trouble up there either. So it's like, despite the fact that I know that area real well, I'm not acquainted with like the services up there. And every single time, it's such a small area. There's so few people that live up there. Every single time I was like, oh man, this is going to be a disaster. Like this is going to be days before anything gets fixed and everything got fixed real quick. So that was like a pleasant surprise. How, how far is that from your place? Uh, it's about eight hours. Well, if you don't stop, it's eight hours straight north and we have kids. So it's more like nine hours. <laughs> That's wicked though. And you, how long were you there for a week or what? We were there for almost two weeks. Actually, we went up uh, Monday, the 20th, and then we came back the following Friday. So we were there um, eat, on the way up and on the way back, we stop in Minneapolis so we stay over because eight hours in the car with my kids is just not, honestly, I don't even like eight hours in the car. So <laughs> I don't mind the break. Um, so we were at the cabin for what would that be like eight days, nine days, something like that. That's wicked. longest. I've, longest I've been there since I was a kid. It was great. That's wicked, man. And just chilling out, fishing, like what kind of stuff do you get up to up there? Yeah. A lot of fishing, a lot of just exploring, you know, my kids are nine and five. So they're like, I, I got to remember that when I was nine, I loved fishing, but I didn't fish all day long. You know, I did a lot of other stuff up there too, like catching frogs and tubing and boating and walking on trails and going to town. So we just do a little bit of everything up there. You know, it's just, it's just nice to be out in nature and like educate them on plants and animals, you know, all that, 
teach them what I'm passionate about. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I was like that as well. Like my dad always tells me stories of like when, when we used to go fishing or something, when we'd go camping and I'd be like an hour and I'd be tapping out. Like now I could fish all day, but back then it was mm -hmm. like, I just couldn't sit still at that, that age. Yep. There's no way. Same. Like I have all these memories of fishing when I was a kid, but I know they're just like little moments peppered in. Cause I also remember a lot of time, like sitting on the boat with like a book or my game boy and like being kind of bored. Cause nothing was biting. And I gotta, I gotta remind myself that those moments happen too. And it's okay. If it's not nonstop action with my own kids, you know, that's fun. That's so funny. My dad <laughs> always tells a story of me sitting in the front of the boat with my game boy. That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm still amazed I never dropped it in the lake. I did drop some other toys in the lake. Apparently I had, I don't remember this because I was like three, but I had a favorite car and I was driving it on like our, the sides of our boat growing up were completely flat. It wasn't like a bass boat. So I was driving my car on there and I dropped it in. It was like, I didn't have a lot of toys when I was a kid. So it was like one, probably one of my only toys. And apparently I was just sobbing and stuff. And it was like eight feet of water. And my dad actually jumped in and got it. He found it and That's rescued unreal. it for me because they didn't want to deal with my crying probably. <laughs> That's unreal, man. I, yeah, I'm excited actually. My, uh, my, my dad tells me yesterday, cause I don't, I work for my dad, but I don't really okay. work with him very often. We do home renovations. Mm -hmm. So he usually just deals with customers and, and then I go and do the work with my cousin and, um, yesterday because my cousin's sick this week so my dad came into work on on the friday just to check in on the job site see how it's doing and we're sitting there wiring up a little bit of stuff in this bathroom and uh he looks at me he goes we we're supposed to go camping next weekend and then i'm like hey so we still going camping next weekend like we're gonna go fishing and he goes yeah um i'm also gonna get a second dog so we're gonna go pick up a puppy on the way up and i'm like oh wow <laughs> Uh, just that, like, that adds a joke, man. that adds a whole new wrinkle doesn't it <laughs> dude so sick and um yeah he's getting a little golden retriever puppy and he's like super fired up for it i that was our first dog was like a little golden retriever so pretty stoked for it right now because we got a like a nine should be 10 a 10 year old boxer so uh i think having a little puppy will probably keep her a little bit younger for her the rest of her life man i'm pretty stoked that's awesome. Really exciting. Yeah, definitely going to have to go by and visit. But how, how, how have you found like, because you're back at work this week, how have you found like kind of the adjustment back after a vacation like that? You're kind of like, it's like a stressful, a low key stressful vacation. I thought that it was going to be tough to get back to work. Usually when I take any time off, even a day or two, the first day I go back, I just feel off. I just don't, I don't quite feel right. I'm a very routine oriented person and anything that disrupts my routine usually is a pretty big deal for me it's honestly why I don't take a lot of vacations so I thought you know I'll take in, I took a total of two weeks off from work I have never taken two consecutive weeks off from work in my life so I expected to come back and, and like this was my first week back I expected to come back and be just really off and really out of it for whatever reason I don't know why yet I'm still trying to figure it out but for whatever reason, it just didn't play out that way. And I, I just jumped right back in like nothing happened. I didn't even I didn't even forget any of my passwords, which is <laughs> that's what I was really worried about. I have so many passwords. It was really good. It's been really good. I'm not sure what it was about. I'm, I don't know what was different this time. I haven't figured it out yet, but it's been pretty easy to just jump right back in. It's like I was like I never left. Yeah, I was going to ask you like maybe what what was like a catalyst there for you because I'm the exact same I'm like a big routine guy and anytime that I um, take any time off my routine or like vary from my routine at all I just feel weird like I feel off mm -hmm. yep completely off. um like what was the catalyst for taking that amount of time off no I mean like just uh what was the catalyst this time that kind of let you just kind of sink back into your rhythm I'm honestly not Sure. Um, one, one theory that I have, and I don't know if this is the answer, but it is something I did differently this time is since this was a longer vacation. And since I knew, you know, I wanted to go, the vacation was for everybody, but in some ways it was more for my kids than me. Cause like, I want them to experience 
that setting in that area and since we don't live up there anymore like that's kind of their only shot i mean we live in a fairly like foresty area but it's not the same as northern minnesota um so i wanted to be able to let go at their speed kind of just chill and relax so i, I made a decision that i was not gonna consume any caffeine for that time because i i'm a pretty high energy person without caffeine with caffeine i'm a little crazy and like for work and stuff that can be good but if i'm trying to relax and and take it easy i that's hard for me to do without caffeine so i'm like i'm just gonna try and experiment and see what happens and i'm not a huge caffeine drinker anyway first couple of days were rough i was surprised by how rough they were like i was tired i had headaches i was I was clearly having withdrawals and that shocked me because I drink one, maybe two cups of coffee a day. Like it's not a huge part of my life. Um, but after that, it's like something just clicked and I felt, I don't remember the last time I felt that calm and relaxed. And for a few days I was just riding high. I'm like, Oh man, I'm onto something. Like maybe I'm just not a person who should be consuming caffeine. And then I thought, wait a minute, you're an idiot you're on vacation. Like, you're, you're surprised that you're feeling calm and relaxed. You're on a vacation in like your safe place, your favorite place. Like, like obviously you feel this way. So I'm like, okay, I gotta be, you know, I'm a, I'm a psychologist. I'm a scientist. Better test this. Got a hypothesis. Time to test it. So about a weekend, I go to the gas station and I grab like an iced coffee in a can, drink it that morning. And I was like on edge, grumpy that day even though we're still on vacation. So I'm like, okay, I think I'm on. I think I'm a person who needs to have very minimal caffeine intake. So I have carried that over um, since coming back. Most days I'm, I'm trying to keep it at zero. I'll let myself have a little. Um, I'm kind of I'm kind of moving away from coffee because it's harder to like customize the, the amount, you know? Like, I mean, you can control how strong you make it, but a lot of times my wife makes it. And she likes it very strong, so I don't have much say in that. Um, so I've been doing a lot of like some of the powdered energy drinks and I'll do like a half scoop on a day when I know I'm gonna be real busy on a, on a more like on a weekend or on a slower day at work, I'm trying to keep it at zero. And I do wonder if that has helped me just be a little more flexible and easygoing. I feel like it has. So that's the only theory I have at this point. That's, that's wicked, man. I'm actually personally, I've, I've been trying to detox my brain currently actually as well. I, um, I stopped smoking pot 19 days ago, but the other thing I was going to say, and I was a pretty heavy pot smoker before, like I was kind of like, I, I talked about this a couple of times on the podcast. So for anyone that's listened to this before, I'm sorry, but it was kind of like literally part of my identity, like in my group of friends, like I was like, kind of like the stoner, the pothead, you know, like, sure. Yeah. And so like, uh, yeah, 19 days ago, I stopped smoking pot just because I was like, I got to hit refresh on this brain. But 29 days ago, like, I'm, I'm excited because tomorrow's day 30 of no caffeine, actually. And nice. so I, I was a heavy, I had no, no moderation. That's part of my problem, man. And so like when I was drinking coffee, I'm drinking like a pot, a pot and a half a day to myself. Like I'm a freak that way. And um, I mean, it's part of the problem with like with heavy pot addiction, you need something to keep you going. Right. So it was like, of course, they went hand in hand for me. And uh, yeah, for so long, I'm wondering why I'm so anxious and jittery. But th that was my kind of uh, that was the conclusion I came to. So I quit both. But it's uh, taken me like almost 30 days now to level out, but I'm, uh, I'm feeling pretty good now with like little cat, like no caffeine, pretty much I'm drink I just drink decaffeinated tea in the morning mm -hmm. and then water all day. That's awesome. That's funny that we're on kind of the same journey at the same time. Funny how that goes. Yeah, man, I definitely did have had pretty, uh, pretty brutal withdrawals though for us. I feel like oh, I would <laughs> the withdrawals were worse from the caffeine almost than the pot like the pot it took me like maybe a week or so and then it's just weird little like triggers like when I used to smoke I'd kind of have like the the same kind of triggers like oh like before meal before bed kind of thing at night mm -hmm. but with caffeine it's like man wicked physical withdrawals like insane when you're drinking a pot and a half a day like stupid withdrawals man <laughs> That's a lot of coffee. 
it was insane but yeah i kind of uh it's like from the what like when you're drinking that much coffee it's like is this really sustainable are my kidneys gonna be happy are my is my brain gonna be happy like there there were there had to be a change man for sure probably got a lot more money in your pocket these days too <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. The <laughs> savings. Well, it's it's kind of funny. If we can make a different, like uh, the Canadian government definitely doesn't make it easy to keep a lot of money in your pocket, but <laughs> for sure, for sure, saving more money, man. Oh, um, have you have you been up to Canada actually? Because you're right on the border, right? Our our cabin is pretty close to the border. Um, the closest I've been to Canada. Does the Boundary Waters count? I've done the Boundary Waters. Okay, I don't, yeah, I don't, yeah. Okay. I don't know how far. Like I couldn't tell you. Ex- I was ten, I think, eleven maybe. So I couldn't tell you exactly where we went to. I've never like formally entered Canada. My wife and I, before our kids were born, had a trip planned, and I, I don't remember why, but we changed our mind. I think it was too expensive. We didn't have a lot of money at the time. I was still in school, so money was pretty tight. Um, I am 100... Honestly, I'm worried that if I visited Canada that I would want to live there. <laughs> there I area. know, because it's basically just a giant version of northern Minnesota with more cities is essentially the picture in my head, and I think that's pretty accurate. Um I'm I'm almost certain that I would absolutely fall in love with it, which makes me not want to visit because then I feel like I'd have a hard time being happy here. It yeah, it depends. It depends on the area you go. I think uh, if you ever been, have you been to Washington State, like anywhere in the Pacific Northwest? Been to the Oregon coast, yeah. Yeah, it's really similar to that where I live, like in Vancouver here on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. So it's it's pretty similar. I always say like to any of my American friends, it's like definitely. Uh, very similar like Washington State, Oregon State mm-hmm. that way. But there's certain provinces in Canada, like literally within this week, my buddy that lives a little bit further east, he's like covering his truck with moving blankets this week because of hailstorms and tornadoes that are going on near his place. I'm like, yeah. man, that's wicked. Well, we get plenty of that stuff here in Iowa too. A couple of years ago, we had like one of the arguably the worst natural disaster in the state's history um it's called a derecho which i didn't even know what it was it's basically a hurricane and like the city i live in lost 60 percent of its trees it was that bad it was one of the most insane things i've ever seen so we don't we don't dodge that just by being in the midwest usa we get some pretty quite crazy weather here too that's nuts man man that's insane absolute bonkers do people like freak out around that time? Is that when you start recommending your book? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. There's definitely like a a citywide residual trauma from that. So that storm was two years ago in August, and just this past uh, Wednesday, I think it was, the weather conditions were very similar. Um, it had been a, like a major heat wave, very windy. And there were some like clouds that apparently looked derecho like potentially. And like, it's supposed to be this once in a lifetime event, right? Like I'll probably never see anything like that again, as long as I live, but everyone in my area on social media and stuff was all freaking out and everyone was going out and buying. Cause we were, um, the city was without power for like at least a, the whole city didn't have power for at least a week. Um, where we live, we were kind of on the outskirts of town. We didn't have power for 10 days. So, you know, it was, it was an interesting way of living for a while. So when this new storm was on the horizon, everybody was going out and buying gas and like generators and stuff, chainsaws, preparing for it again, wasn't a big deal this time, but you, you can clearly see it has affected the, the mentality of everyone who lives here. We're all on edge now, anytime it's similar conditions. Yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean, like, because probably Texans are like that as well now during the winter after that big lock mm-hmm. or the big shutdown that they had. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. When any, I mean, it's it's hard to say these days what what constitutes a trauma. You know, that's a very that's a very like uh, a controversial term these days. Um, you know, the DSM would say it's something when your life was in danger or you felt like it could have been in danger. And at, at least 
at least for me, I never felt during the storm, like I was at work, we have a pretty good sized building. It's pretty sturdy. Like it's one story. So I, I never felt like I was going to die during that storm. In fact, I didn't realize how bad it was till I went home that day, honestly. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it was just the aftermath of like, you don't realize what life would be like without electricity. And this was like August in Iowa, mostly mid eighties, high eighties during the day. And then it gets cold at night. Um, you know, no, no refrigeration, you know, you, it's hard to run a fridge with a generator that takes a lot of power. So most, a lot of us were living at, I bought a, I bought the biggest Yeti cooler they make. And we were just living out of that for a week. Um, I didn't mind it because for me, it just kind of reminded me of my childhood because that's not that different than how we lived growing up in Northern Minnesota. Like I said, we grew up without air conditioning. Our hot water heater never worked. So it's like, I was, and I, I thought it was almost like a, I, I hate to say this because this, this would be very invalidating to a lot of people, but I almost felt like it was kind of like a fun adventure. But I know that for a lot of people, they would consider that to have been a traumatic experience. And, you know, as a psychologist, I feel like where you can really see that is when you see like residual traumatic reactions to similar situations. Cause I, like, I, like I said, I saw people on social media who were just like, like just this past week during the storm that ended up being nothing. We're outside like live streaming the clouds coming in and like clearly starting to feel panic. It's like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be reacting that way to this storm had this other storm not happened two years ago. This is your brain and your nervous system being on edge because this reminds you of something that was a much bigger deal in your life. And that, when you see someone respond in that way, that is clearly a trauma response. So you can, you can get all up in arms about like, well, your life was never really in danger. So you can't be traumatized by that. But clearly people were, they, they obviously were. And, and you can see that by their reactions under similar circumstances. And, and I see that a lot with my therapy clients, for example, too, not even just with the storm, with, with things, you know, there's a lot of other things that pe people may not think of as traumatic, like let's say bullying, not like getting beat up every day, but just like relentless teasing. That's not gonna kill you, right? It's not a life-threatening trauma. But when you see someone who's been through that kind of thing, who's in their 20s, 30s, not dealing with it anymore, like it's over and done with, they're around mature adults who aren't acting that way, they have safe relationships, and they are still on edge about like perceived rejection or perceived teasing to the point where they're constantly looking for it, constantly scanning for it, getting really nervous or scared or angry if they feel like they see it, that's trauma. That's clearly a trauma response. And I don't really care if someone thinks that the events that precipitated that response should or shouldn't be traumatic to a person it doesn't really matter what you think because they obviously were and the proof is in the response yeah yeah i mean it's it's crazy to think that we see that in like both uh large scale like in society but also like you're saying like in that kind of like one-on-one -on -one or maybe like in a group setting like a small group setting because like we had a big national freak out yesterday and I don't know if you heard about this, but like Rogers, one of our uh, service providers had a huge shutdown Canada wide. So like mm. most people, like it was probably like, I don't know, my rough estimation would be like a third of people's cell phones had no service. And then like debit machines across the country weren't working, tons of different things weren't working. So like, for example, I went to go buy food on my way home, couldn't buy any food, like in fr Friday, Saturday is usually like my grocery day. So it's uh, like crazy to see like how like the fabric of society could fall apart so quickly and everyone's reaction is so different because there's people like, you know, for instance, like my girlfriend, she's like, dude, my gas is empty on my car. And if I can't buy gas, I can't work tomorrow. And then there's other people like I go to the gym and they're like laughing about people that freak out about mm -hmm. that. And it's like, yeah. for some people, they're okay. But other people like that is a serious impact in their life. Mm -hmm. and it's crazy to think about um 
you know, and even I fall into this sometimes too, like that kind of insensitivity, insensitivity towards, you know, other people's kind of traumatic experience of like, yeah, this is a big deal for them. You know, this is huge because maybe it is touching on something that they've had before. Like, um, you know, I, I, I would be lying if I said that I don't have those feelings of like inadequacy from like childhood experiences sometimes come back. And there's things that I react to where people are like, bro, it's not a big deal, but it's like, it seems like a big deal for me right now. I don't know why you could say that. Yeah, it's it. what is and isn't a big deal. This is why I, I honestly don't think we're ever going to be able to arrive at an objective definition of trauma because what is a big deal to one person is going to vary so much from one person to the next. Like, like I said, that storm for me wasn't a big deal because I have had similar experiences to that growing up that were like on purpose, like... To me, it was just kind of like camping in my house. And I love, you know, I love camping. So I'm like, this is, this is fine. But I, I understand and respect that for people who don't have that kind of like outdoorsy background, that, that this, just, this just felt awful. This wasn't fun. This wasn't an adventure. This, this just was miserable and scary. And, um, and, and I, I understand that. And, you know, on the flip side, I know there's a lot of things that bother me, like kind of like what you were just saying. There's a lot of things I'm sensitive to that most people are like, well, that's not, that shouldn't be a problem for you. I'm very sensitive to like wording, phrasing, wording choices. If people word things a certain way, I tend to feel very hurt by that. And then I'll kind of isolate myself and people are like, you know why? That's not what they meant. Why are you reacting that way? And sometimes I can articulate why, sometimes I can't, but pretty much every single time it somehow relates to you know something I've been through in my past that was not okay for me I've I've never been I've never been a very like emotionally resilient person I'm physically resilient I'm not real emotion my feelings get hurt easy I'm sensitive I read into things and so a lot of what I think people would consider normal childhood experiences playful teasing you know boys being boys stuff like that were like really unpleasant for me to the point where like I, I hated them and didn't know how to cope with them because they created real emotional dis they, they weren't just fun little things for me so like every person's gonna have their own different version of that you know some of us are highly sensitive to lifestyle changes like losing power some of us are highly sensitive to teasing to language choices some of us are highly sensitive to rejection and those individual personality variables are going to change what is or isn't traumatic to a person and and ultimately i think you can't judge it based on what the event was you have to judge it based on the response and if a person is clearly showing a trauma response that means what they went through was traumatic to them I think that's the best definition we can ever have. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, too, that um, like different people across the board, like it's not like um, I'm trying to find a way to, to explain what I'm thinking about. But it's I was thinking about this earlier this week, how we have different resiliencies to maybe events than we do to people. Like there's times like um, like people don't tend to get me down usually like it, it's kind of like uh i mean this is probably a character flaw in and of itself but like when people like kind of get on my nerves i just kind of write them off i'm like oh that person's just an idiot like that's just the way i look at it it's like oh we disagree like they're obviously just an idiot and then there's other times where like i'm at work and this ties back into what i was saying earlier like feeling of like inadequacy like if i mess a ton of things up at work like i mess up like you know, I build something wrong or I, I you know, et cetera, like things like that will get me down more than people will. Do you get, do you get what I'm saying? I do. I do. It's, it seems like what that kind of sounds like to me is you're more likely to, to personalize or internalize like a, a performance situation, uh, an outcome of something you do, than you are something that someone says to you. Like your boundaries with those situations are very different. See, I'm, it's funny because I'm the opposite. <laughs> I, I can screw things up all day long. And I'll, I mean, I don't love that, but I also, I generally have a lot of confidence in my abilities. So if I do mess something up, I'm like, eh, I'll figure it out eventually. But when when people don't like what I have to say, that's that's actually pretty hard for me to cope with, which probably brings into question why I ever thought being on 
professional social media would be a good idea, but so far it's gone. Okay. <laughs> it's interesting that I think you probably just gave me a pretty good clue into it. It's like definitely a performance base. Like maybe I won't be able to ever do this. Like a lot of things like that kind of tie into like the, uh, the sensitivities I have. Whereas like with people, like ever since I was a kid, I was kind of that class clown saying things that piss some people off. So I guess I'm more like conditioned to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And we all have different, you know, our, our boundaries are kind of like, how much do we let things in, right? Like how, how personally do we take these things? How much do we feel like these things reflect on who we are? How much do they say about us? And people have very different boundaries with different situations. Um, I wouldn't necessarily describe what you were talking about as far as relationally. I wouldn't say it's a character flaw. You, you have firm boundaries with other people. There's no exact right way to be with your personal boundaries. Every, every strategy you can have is going to have pros and cons. So, you know, an approach like yours might result in you having a smaller social circle, but it's also going to result in you not getting your feelings hurt as often by other people, not spending a lot of time in disagreement or conflict with other people. If you tried to be the opposite and tried to just be really accepting of other perspectives and viewpoints, even if they totally didn't align with yours. Um, yeah, you might have a lot, you might have a wider social circle, you might have more diversity and perspectives and whatnot, but you're also going to probably spend a lot of time arguing with people. And that's not necessarily great either. There, <laughs> there's pros and cons to almost any approach you can take in life. Like there's, as someone who works in mental health, there are very few things like universal strategies I can give to people. The only universal mental health strategies are, are typically your basic physiological fundamentals. And that's, that is why I hit on those things frequently, like in my social media content, in my book, because there's, there, there's a few things where it doesn't matter who you are, these things will help you. You know, things like trying to get about eight hours of sleep a night, that's average. Some people need more, some people need less, but typically somewhere in that range making sure your nutrition is decent, making sure you're not skipping meals, making sure you're not nutritionally deficient in certain areas, being physically active. These things help everybody. Doesn't matter who you are, doesn't matter age, gender, ethnicity, diagnoses, no diagnoses. They'll help a person who has no mental health conditions be happier. But beyond those few basic fundamentals, it gets very individualized and there's no universal right answers. And that's, that's part of what makes therapy and, and writing self-help books and things like that difficult because well, especially writing a book because you don't know who's reading it you know I, I can't tell a person how to fix their relationships in a book because I, I don't know who they are I don't know what their relationships are like I don't know what kind of relationship problems they're having and you know, there's there's not a lot that's guaranteed to work a lot of it's very personal and very situational and really needs to be customized to the individual I, I, I see exactly what you're saying, but I got to give you credit, man, because I think that your book, like you did a really good job. But I was actually thinking I, like this week, I was like, I got to re-listen to it because I got the audiobook version of it as well. And I listened to audiobooks during work. But I, I like the way that you kind of relate it back to personal stories. Like the very beginning of it was like, when I first started listening to it, you open up with that fishing scene and I'm like, man, mm -hmm. this hits home for me. Yeah, that's... um. That's the the place I was just at. That's where that happened. That's that same lake. I was and I was posting some photos and stories of the lake those past couple of weeks. That's the lake in the story. It's uh it's an interesting lake because it's one of the clearest lakes in northern Minnesota. Um, when I was growing up, I think the clarity was about twelve feet. It's actually even more now because we got zebra mussels, which uh, I know they're not good, but they do make the water pretty beautiful. What is that? Which, I'm not even sure what that is. Oh, do you guys not have those up there? Like actual, so oh, okay, I can picture it in my head now. Yeah, like a yeah. Monster. So they're like they kind of look like clams. They're like small clams, but they're they got black and white stripes, kind of like a zebra. Um, I don't actually know what they do that's bad per se, but I know that they they have a filtering effect on the water. I think they eat like algae, and that, that probably is what they do. That's bad. They probably steal nutrients from native plants and animals and whatnot but they have a filtering effect on the water. So they actually increase the, the water clarity, but they're an invasive species. So it's not great that we have them. My daughter accidentally caught one on our trip 
with her lure somehow like she actually brought one on the boat we didn't it took us a second to even figure out what had happened um but that's again like the water clarity like so many things we're talking about so it's kind of a metaphor like it's a pros and cons situation it's a beautiful lake i mean just to be able to like look you can see so far out and it's just gorgeous and it's crisp and it's clear but there's a couple downsides to that. One is it can make the fishing more difficult because the fish can see you. So, you know, you got to have a pretty good presentation because they can see you, they can see your boat. But the other is, and this, again, this one's probably real specific to me. I don't know that this would bother a lot of people, but when you have a really clear lake, like there, there's this little range where you can kind of see, but not quite. You can see shapes and outlines and movement but you can't perfectly see what you're looking at and that little area always creeped me out because yeah. i would constantly i would constantly be seeing stuff in there but i couldn't see it clear enough to know what it was and it it just always put me on edge and i know i was i'm pretty sure i was the only one in my family that was bothered by that i remember always wanting to fish in either really shallow or really deep areas because anytime we'd be in that kind of drop off mid-range area I would just get this really unsettled feeling I always felt like I was going to see something that I wasn't supposed to or like that didn't make sense and it was just going to bother me forever and I think that experience that I wrote about in the book really reinforced that because then like, basically my worst fear came true I saw something big and scary and weird that I couldn't totally understand or rationalize no one else saw like other people were in the boat with me but no one else saw it so I couldn't really explain it to them and therefore they didn't really understand why I was as bothered by it as I was and you know, I, I, I don't think seeing a large fish in a clear lake is something that would upset a lot of people but there's something about the way it interacts with my brain that like that's a very unpleasant situation for me so like so many things in life the clarity of that lake is it's a pros and cons for me yeah i i kind of i kind of vibe with exactly what you're saying because i i remember there was this weird dream i had when i was a little kid about like it was like open waters like i've always been all right with lakes but like open waters like the ocean creep me creep me out man and it's weird because we live right by the ocean here but I, I remember so vividly this one dream where I'm pretty much at the drop off I dunk my head under the water and it's just nothing like but water forever like that was like this weird dream that I had and um I don't know if it was just like the like the size insignificance I felt being out there in this dream like this because this isn't real life even like this is just a dream or just like the abyss of the unknown, you know, like, cause it's like, if you could see forever essentially. Right. And it's like, yeah. um, I, that, that part, like just connected that it reminded me of that dream that I had when I was a little kid. And it's so weird. Cause I was probably like eight when I had that dream, like it's like 20 years ago almost. Mm -hmm. And I still remember it so vividly of just like dunking the head under and just like, Whoa, like everything around me. And uh, I think it connects exactly with what you're saying, like the unknown, the abyss out there. Like it's kind of like um, it connects pretty well with that experience, man. That's interesting because that's very similar to a I don't know if I had this dream just once and just never forgot about it or if it was a recurring dream for me. But I definitely remember I'm sure I was around that age. I used to every morning very first thing I'd do when I'd wake up is I would just run down to the dock and just again because the lake was so clear just see what was down there because a lot of times there'd be like interesting fish or turtles or frogs or whatever and I just loved that like sense of discovery but I remember so I and no one else was like yeah let's go run down to the dock at 7 30 so I used to be down there alone and I definitely remember having a dream or like really a nightmare I guess I would say where I'd run down to the dock run to the end of it look around and then when I turned back and looked ashore, the dock had disconnected from the shore and it was just floating out into the middle of the lake. And it's a similar kind of insignificant, helpless feeling. It was just like this feeling of dread or terror, even though like logically I can say like, well, I would just swim back to shore if that happened. But somehow in the dream, I wasn't able to. And yeah, kind of a similar dream, 
provoking a similar similar feeling i guess I, I do think you know other water especially big water big lakes oceans it's probably the closest thing we have on earth to like outer space where it's like these big open areas that really have this special ability to make you aware of your own insignificance and i've heard a lot of people describe that as like a pleasant feeling and not so much for me <laughs> and for you either it sounds like yeah, no, not at all. I, I've, uh, I've only been tidal fishing a couple of times. And I know that every time I kind of get that feeling of like, man, this place is so vast. <laughs> it's insane. And I think it is kind of like the insignificance. I think it's also like the um, like what's out there, you know, like, especially like in a lake, I, I kind of feel and this is just my experience, like, I kind of feel like there's probably not things that are bigger than me out here mm -hmm. but like with an ocean i'm like there is 100 percent things that are way bigger than me out here and yeah. like they could just destroy me if they wanted like what but there's no sense of like i could even see it coming kind of thing or i think a lot of the times with water especially it's like we're so slow in water too as human beings like everything that's in the water is so efficient at moving and breathing and seeing and and we're like I got my life jacket. <laughs> right. If that, yeah. if, if that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally get that. Like wa water, you kind of feel like an alien when you're in water. Like this is not my home and there's other things around me and this is their home. This is their native environment. And I'm like a visitor or maybe even more like an intruder here. I, logically, I know that this is where it gets a little different because like I know that logically, even in a big lake, there probably isn't anything really big or dangerous in it. But especially as a kid, even today, to some extent, it doesn't stop me from wondering, like the, the lake that we grew up on, it's not a, it's a decent sized lake. It's not huge. It's 1200 acres, not small, not gigantic, but it's fairly deep. I think the max depth is like 95 feet. And I know exactly because we had all these topography maps uh, around our cabin. I know exactly where that spot is. And every time we'd go over that spot, I'd just be like, I wonder, like 95 feet down is a long ways. There could be something weird down there. Yeah. Um, we also used to go to, uh, are you familiar with uh, Mille Lacs? Do you know that lake? No, no. It's, it's in Minnesota. It's huge. I think it's like the third, fourth biggest lake in Minnesota. It's about 140,000 acres. So I mean, it's big enough that you cannot see. And it's just a big circle. It's not like a lot of big lakes where it's lots of little bays and stuff. It's just a huge oval. That's all it is. So you can't see across it. And that's a lot of the, the state record muskies from there. I think the walleye might be too. I mean, it's, it does have huge fish in it, but that's another lake. Every time I see it, I'm just like, I wonder. Like a lake this big, no one really knows what's in it. There could be something weird in there that no one's ever found yet. Yeah, I was like literally just Googling pictures of it. It looks huge, man. What's the depth on a lake like that? Do you know the depth or should I just... That one is really weird. So Malax, the max depth is like 30 some feet. It is, it is a very unusual lake. It's like a giant bowl. Yeah, I know you, you look at it and you think, I bet that lake's like 300 feet deep. It's, it's, a, it's a strange place. Yeah, yeah. I, I just this year, actually, I was fishing at a lake. I think the biggest depth, I think, was around 80 feet. And I was thinking, like, kind of a similar feeling that you're feeling like it's like, man, that is so deep. If I were to think of that as like a height of a building, like, I'd be looking right. straight up. Like, yeah, exactly. To think that's under me right now. Mm -hmm. It's crazy. And, and that no, and that no one's ever seen it. You know, like no one's ever, at least in, in, in our lake, you know, no one's like scuba diving to the bottom of it. No, exactly. It's, yeah. It's, it's like literally like I'm 90 feet away from something no human being has ever seen. It's kind of a weird feeling. Do, you, do your kids ever feel like have they express like kind of feeling the same way? To a, to a degree, our son has a little bit. Um, he's, he seems to be more lighthearted about it than I was. He's like, he said like, oh, I wonder what's down there. And I, I showed him the deepest spot because he was curious. And 
he's like, I always wonder if there's like sea monsters or something in here. So he has like the same thought process, but he just seems more curious about it. He doesn't seem disturbed by it, like, which is good. I'm thankful that he's not like me in that regard. He just seems to think it's cool. So like, yes and no, same thought process, different emotional reaction, which kind of goes back to what we were talking about a little bit ago that we don't, you know, we don't all have the same feelings about things and what's interesting or fun or adventurous for one person is terrifying for another. He thankfully does not seem to be uh, very disturbed by that. Take him to the dentist and you will see a different situation. <laughs> that was a, that was a different kind of adventure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that was something that made me pretty uncomfortable as well. Actually, I still feel uncomfortable around the dentist actually. <laughs> sure. A lot of people do. That one is fairly common, I guess. And I, interestingly enough, that's one that never really bothered me that much. I don't know why. I don't like love going to the dentist, but I'm like, oh, it's not a big deal. Um, whereas, you know, some people have panic attacks from dental cleanings, like the the restriction, I think the powerlessness that can really get to you, especially if you've maybe not had great experiences with things like that in the past. Do your kids as well, like I've, I've kind of wondered during this conversation, do your kids show interest in like psychology and like what you do as well? Like, do, you, do they ever like kind of ask you about like what you do for work or, or show an interest in that? Not in a real direct way yet, but I can, I can clearly see that they both have an innate interest in mental health. They are both, they're both helpers. They're both people that are very in tune with the emotions of others and, and very like willing to help, which is really cool. Cause I, and I, I'm going to take absolutely no credit for that. That's just who they are. They're just inherently that way. Um, seeing their relationship with one another has been really eye-opening for me too. So like I am, I'm the oldest of three. I have a sister that's two years younger and a brother that's four years younger. And we, we played together constantly. Like we did everything together. We had, we had adventures together, et cetera. But I didn't even realize until seeing my own kids that like we were not affectionate with one another. We were not physically affectionate. Ever. I, I don't really ever remember like hugging my siblings. We didn't really say nice things to each other. We weren't inherently mean either, but I don't really remember us like complimenting each other or congratulating each other. And my kids, they are like that. Like they, they hold hands, they hug, they say, I love you. And it, it just makes me think like, there, there's something there that we did not have as siblings. I don't know why that is. I don't know what the difference is. Um, they have a really special bond though. And it's really cool to see. And again, I don't feel like I did that. That's, I, they get the credit for that. But it's, it, it is interesting when you have kids, if, if you have your own siblings, like you notice differences in that relationship. And like, they are definitely, I think it's easy for parents I feel like every parent I know does this where it's like it's really easy to get in your head about the things you maybe liked about yourself or are proud of about yourself if your kids don't have that it's really easy to stress about that like I think every parent is like oh you know when I was your age I didn't do this or I did do this and I get I, I'm not going to claim to be immune to it because they're not, my kids are definitely not as adventurous as me. And I don't know if that's their personality or where they, you know, they grew up in a suburban household. I grew up in Northern Minnesota in a cabin. So it's like, you know, those are very different settings. But I think about like when I was four or five years old, going down to the dock alone and just exploring, which maybe I shouldn't have been doing in retrospect, that, that might've been a little too soon for that. That might not have been totally safe, but uh, my son is nine and like, he, he won't do that without me. And it's easy for me to be like, oh, not like, you know, is he ever going to be able to be independent? Is he ever going to be able to do things on his own? Which I know is kind of silly, but then it's, it's just as important. I think more important as a parent to recognize skills or traits or positive qualities that your kids have that you did not have. Cause he's got, there's, there's a lot of things I liked about myself that I, I don't know if I see in my kids yet. There's also a lot of things that are great about them that I did not have that maybe to some degree still don't have. And you got to pay attention to that stuff too. That's what I think a lot of parents miss 
and, and not only does that stress you out as a parent, I think it can also really create a rift between you and your kids too. Because if your kids grow up feeling like they're expected to be something they aren't, and at the same time, the things that are really good about them or really special about them are not appreciated by their parents, that's, that sets a difficult tone for your relationship. And that's something I really try to do as a parent is make sure I notice the things that are really special about them that I, that I didn't have. Like my, my son is a better big brother than I ever was. Like it's not even close. He, he's, he's such a caring older brother and I was very aloof and selfish, honestly. And I try to make sure I really appreciate that about him and let him know I appreciate it. It's interesting you say that because I like, I've got two sisters. I got one older, one younger. And like, we had a similar experience. I feel like from my perspective, I don't know if they'd say the same thing, but we had a similar experience to what you described. Like, I remember like kind of playing, like if we go like on a family vacation or like, you know, um, but we never really were like, kind of like you said, like a very like physically affectionate with each other. Like, I don't remember like the big hugging, like when my little sister was a baby, I definitely was like kind of obsessed with her. Like I was like, I like playing with her because I was just interested at, at, at I was like five years old. So a baby was like cool for me. Like I was like, whoa, this is such a new experience. But like even to this day, like like we don't really hang out. And I guess that's something we can change now as adults. But like we don't really hang out. We're not really like we love each other. We like don't get me wrong. But like we don't hang out. We don't chat like there's no like I know people that like text with their siblings all the time. Like that's not really the relationship we have. And um, it's it's kind of funny to think about that that way like I think that well maybe this this could be a question rather than a statement but do you think that maybe like the next generation has like kind of a higher EQ that way like kind of like that I, emotional intelligence I I 100% think that I, I I think I mean you know I haven't been alive through that many generations but I feel like that has been kind of a consistent societal trend overall I do feel like each generation probably on average seems like they're a little more in tune with their own feelings, a little more aware of the feelings of others, a little more open about their feelings. Like I would say, like my generation compared to my parents' generation, I would say we in general probably had a higher skill level in those areas. But then I see kids now, I'm like, these people are talking about things and like listening to others like this would have never happened when I was a kid I think about things like like gender identity for example uh, I I can't I mean don't get me wrong I know we have a lot of work to do in acceptance as a society but but I, I also just can't believe like how open especially younger people are in general about like other people's gender identity because I just remember everyone being teased for everything all the time even the littlest thing like you could get teased for like having the wrong name brand of clothes when I was growing up. Like you, you could be ridiculed for that. And I feel like now it's like, I just feel like society is getting, again, still got a ways to go, but it's getting so much more accepting of differences and diversity and so much more willing to consider the feelings of others. And I, I, really, I really feel optimistic for, for the future as far as things like mental health and you know relationships and emotional intelligence and things like that I I feel like we are very much trending in the right direction in those areas and it's really exciting to see yeah it's it's so weird to see as well like um I, I kind of play with those kind of concepts in my head as well because there's so many people and like like you said like your parents generation like my dad was definitely one of those like uh I always refer to him as like the stereotypical Canadian dad. Like my dad is like that, you know, and he's probably pretty similar to like a lot of people in like, you know, the, the, the Midwest, the, like kind of that area as well. Like he's, he's one of those guys that just like, all he does, he gets after it. He's just working all the time. He wants to play sports. He wants to watch sports, like very, very active outdoorsy guy. Like, like I said, like he, if he can get a weekend off and go fishing with his dog, like that's his, like that's heaven for him. And there's always stories, like you said, like kind of, you know, maybe these are stories that I kind of use as comparisons for me. I don't know, maybe if he looks at me and compares himself that way, but like he'll tell stories of, oh, like when I was your age, I was rebuilding cars in my front yard kind of thing. And 
all these different things like um you know um where was i going with this oh and we were talking about because actually one of the customers that we're working for the homeowner that we're working for is a retired psychiatrist and so i was asking him yesterday and this guy's in his 80s so pretty high level eq you know like he, you, him and i were talking about stress levels and anxiety levels and we're talking about different books i'm asking him about different things and what his perspective is on these things and like if you were to ask my dad about depression my dad would be like what are you talking about like maybe some people deal with that but i don't deal with that like he's like stress levels like when i'm stressed i just sleep on it you know like those are the the ways that he talks about it and it's like I've always kind of wondered, like, how does this guy never pay attention to mental health, but still never, never struggle with it either? Because if I neglected my mental health, I'd be in sham. Like, I've done it before and I was in sham. Yep. Like, how does that balance work? I wish I knew the answer to that question. Some people, this is something I write about a little bit in the book, though. It's another way that we're all built different is some of us, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the alcoholism gene, for example. I mean, I know it's not just one gene, but like some people can go out on a Friday night and binge drink and be a little hungover Saturday and then recover and then just like go back to normal life, right? Like some people, many people can do that. And then there are some people who that will set off weeks, months, or even years of, of sustained alcohol use that will absolutely ruin their life. Some people can do that. Some people can't. It's not fair, but it's just a way we're built differently. And, you know, mental health is the same way. Some people, I'm not one of these people, but I know that they exist. Some people can not sleep enough, skip meals, work all day long, not get outside, not be physically active, not talk to other people, not make time for hobbies, not take breaks. And it might affect them a little, but then they wake up the next day and they're okay and ready to do it again. I am like you. In fact, I literally, my post today was that, was just about that. Like it was about my own daily mental health routine and how, although it is exhausting and unfair and frustrating, if I don't, I, I have a certain checklist in my head, like you got to do these things every day. If I don't do those things every day, I will go downhill fast. I cannot mess around with that stuff. I have to treat like getting enough sleep, not skipping meals, staying physically active. For me, that's the equivalent of like an alcoholic not letting themselves have a drink. If I slip up even a little bit with that stuff, it will start a downhill slide that will be very, very difficult for me to get my way out of. So I got to stay in my A game with that stuff 24 seven or it goes bad quick. And I have to assume that that's just a way that we're built differently. And some of us I hate, I don't like to use this term because like high maintenance is typically a judgmental term, but some of us do require more maintenance than others. The flip side of that though, is I do feel like those of us who, who require more, this might also sound judgmental, but I feel like often we are capable of achieving more in certain areas when we can meet our very specific criteria. I, I think of it, uh, this is something I wrote about a long time ago. If you think of it, it's kind of like a car, right? Some people are like a Honda Civic, like they're pretty durable, pretty reliable, don't need much. They're pretty much gonna work all right unless you severely mess them up, right? Some of us are more like a Ferrari where it's like, if you, under the right circumstances, this person's going to perform, perform fantastically, but they're going to like, if you are not on top of every little service this is going to fall apart real quick and it's going to be real problematic and expensive to get it back in good working condition. So that's kind of my metaphor that relates to that. Yeah. I like that. And I could, I definitely see like, um, yeah, you take like a high performance car, you put the wrong fuel in it. It's right. toast. It's yeah, it's never going to be the same, or at least not for quite a while, not without a lot of help. Yeah, I, I definitely feel the exact same way. I have my daily checklist, my, my non negotiables, like if I don't exercise, if I don't eat well, even if I eat like too much of the wrong thing, if I like slip up on that meal plan, like, I always look back at like, when I was a little kid, like I was one of those like ADHD kids, like I was like the class clown bouncing off the walls, like, 
teacher could not get me to sit down and shut up if they tried. Like there was no possible way. And I think back to the kinds of foods I was eating as a kid, like those high sugary breakfasts, high sugary snacks, like at lunch, like, you know, those like prepackaged lunches at school. Like, it's like, man, I don't even know how my brain was even close to functioning at that point. Like if I eat like that now, I'm like energy spike for like an hour and then I'm dead. Like that's pretty much how it works for me now. And like, I think back to all those times and it's like, I kind of am, like you said, like I kind of am that high maintenance guy. Like even if I don't sleep well, even if like there's, it's crazy how those things can impact people so much. And then you go to work and talk to other people. Like my cousin's one of those guys where I work with him and I'll talk to him. I'm like, oh, like how's, how's the day going? How's everything going? Like kind of that morning chit chat before work. And he's like, oh yeah, I've been up for hours. My two-year-old was up My three, you're like his, he's three now, but it's like my three-year-old was up early. And like, you can't really choose those things. Like you probably know that much better than I, where it's like that kid decides he wants to wake up early. He's waking up early. Like <laughs> there's nothing you can do. And he's like, yeah, I slept three hours last night. I'm like, how are you functioning like this, man? My brain shuts off with three hours of sleep. I become a grouch. So I'm like, I have zero patience whatsoever. Can't problem solve at all. Like it's crazy how, um, yeah, I guess you're right. Like some people are just way more high maintenance that way. It's a funny way to say it, but it's true. Yeah. And I'm, you know, I, I'm at the point, one of the biggest turning points for me, I think has been just to really like own that and, and acknowledge it and, and not judge myself for it and just meet myself where I'm at. Like food, you gave the example of food. That's that's a great example of like just little, you know, if, if anyone listening kind of relates to that idea that like my nutrition really needs to be on point to feel okay. I mean, that can be tough because the world is not built around that. You know, your job, your relationships are not necessarily built around you meeting your nutritional needs. And once I kind of understood and acknowledged that that was true about me, like I also, I, I also need snacks. I, I can't go between breakfast and lunch or lunch and dinner without eating at least a little something. And if it's just something sugary, I have, I have the exact same problem as y'all get a little bit hyper and then I become basically comatose. And it's like, yeah, I can't do that when I'm at work. So when I go to like long family gatherings, for example, like holidays, when I know I'm probably gonna be here for like seven, eight hours and, you know, a meal will be served at some certain time and it may not be the time I would prefer. And I'm not really going to be in control of when I get to eat. I will bring, I'll bring a little, like, it's, it's, it's kind of like what you do for a kid, but honestly, I, I don't know why that should ever stop or change. I'll bring a little backpack and I'll have like a protein bar, a couple meat sticks in there, whatnot. Like I'll bring my snacks just like I do for my kids. And some people might think that's ridiculous or that's silly, but if that's what helps me feel good and stay socially engaged in that setting and not get grumpy or withdrawn or tired or whatever it may be, you know, if people want to call that high maintenance, that's fine, but it is what it is. That's who I am. I didn't choose to be this way. That's just how I'm made. And I'm going to, I'm going to meet my own needs so that I have the best life I can have. Yeah. And I think part of the the journey of it all too is kind of like um it's kind of like an experiment like it's like a long lasting experiment because you never really know like and this is something I realized a lot with anxiety like you never really know what it's like to feel different until you feel different and uh with like nutrition and food like I've played with my meal plans so many times I've seen doctors and allergists like just specifically talking about like how different foods react with me. And like, I've been on meal plans that are exact opposite of like, right now I'm eating a lot of fruit, a lot of red meat. There's times where like, I wasn't eating any red meat. I would only eat like chicken and fish and I'd have like lots of veggies and carbs. Like there's so many times I've played with this diet. And like, I think back to all the different things I've done with like sleep levels, like waking up at different times. Like I used to be the sleep in, stay up late guy. And, and now I'm on a completely different rhythm. And there's so many times where like, I've just kind of experimented with these things and just understanding like, oh, I can feel different. Oh, I completely, I've never felt this way before, you know? And I think there's a lot of times where we try and force through things. Like there's times like for your example, like having like the snacks, like there'd be so many times where like, 
I, I'm kind of like you as well. Like I got a snack on a little bit of fruit. Like I'm a big fruit guy. That's my snacks. Like I'll have fruit through throughout the day. And then like high, high, high quantities of meat with my meals. But it'd be like, you know, there's definitely been times where I try and fight that urge. Like I'm like, oh, if I just get in the routine of not having snacks, then my body won't demand it anymore. Like you're like almost in denial of like what your body's looking for. And it's crazy to just kind of, uh, I guess, kind of play around with those routines. I don't know if you've kind of felt the same way of just like not really understanding, like uh, not, not understanding that you could feel better until you do. Mm -hmm. No, I've definitely done a lot of like trying not to be this way in my life, kind of trying to like train myself out of those things. And as it sounds like it went for you, it, it's never worked. It's, and, and I, that's why I've come to regard these things as like, these are not, these are not habits that I have. These are just universal truths about who I am. And if I do not acknowledge them, honor them and base my life around them, I'm just not going to have a good life. I'm not going to feel the way I want to feel. Um, and, and those are my choices. Those are my choices. I can try to be somebody I'm not and be unhappy, or I can be who I am and figure out a way to make it work for me, whether, whether others understand it or not. And unfortunately, sometimes they don't, but I can't control that. Uh, yeah, I kind of, I, I agree with that as well. There, there was a long, a long part of my life where like, I used to get really mad when people would say, this is just who I am. This is just how I am. Like, and uh, I was like, maybe part of that's a choice for so long. I kind of thought that way because, and it's weird because sometimes there, it, it is like that. Like I could have easily claimed like, Oh, I'm just the stoner. That's just how I am. Like I've had, you know, especially here in Canada, I don't know how it is politically there, but like um, it's uh, like medicinal marijuana was actually something prescribed for me for a long time for like my attention, my focus, because it was, it, it allowed me to, focus on one task at a time it mellowed me out enough and so for a long time I was like I told myself like this is something I need this is who I am and it's like well maybe there's other catalysts and it's such a weird fine line between like you know um maybe there's reasons why you're bouncing off the wall maybe there's reasons why you can't focus on what you're trying to focus on and uh it, it's such a weird fine line between like who you are and the routine that you're currently in how do you like kind of differentiate that that's a great question and i think the there's a, really only one way to answer it because because it's going to be different for every person the best way to figure out what you know is is this like an artificial need that i have created through a lifestyle habit or is this a genuine need that's a part of me the only way to find out is to run some tests like to experiment with your own lifestyle figure it out because I've, I've had other things like my equivalent of pot was probably video games I was very very into video games for a long like most of my life and I would have told you that that for for most of my life I would have told you that gaming was like a part of who I am an essential part of my self-care something I could never be happy without for any like sustained period of time but as life got busier and busier and busier, I, I just, I was getting to the point where I'm like, something has to get cut out here. There, there's just no way that I can be the kind of professional I want to be, the kind of parent and husband that I want to be, be in the health that I want to be in and have time for all these things. And I'm like, something has to give. And that seemed, gaming seemed like the most optional thing. So I'm like, let me just... I've never tried it. Like I probably hadn't gone more than a few days. I'm, I'm probably I'm trying to remember exactly when this happened, early thirties, probably maybe even late twenties, probably hadn't gone more than a few days without a lot of gaming since I'm like seven, eight years old. So I'm like, maybe I should just try it and see. Turned out, you know, as with any lifestyle change, first few days were rough, always will be. Don't judge it by the first few days. But after a few days, I started to feel better. I started to feel like more connected to other people, more mindful, just more engaged in my life, more engaged in my work, more creative. And I realized that at least for me, I'm not saying this is true for everybody. I, I think for many people, gaming is just fine. But I, I had to realize at that point that for me, is like, I think this was an addiction. 
I think this was something that was really dominating my life in an unhealthy way. And, and I did legitimately enjoy it. I enjoyed it too much. That was the problem. And I regarded it as a need when in fact, this, this was an artificial need that I had created. Like, I, I do not truly need video games to be happy. I do truly need exercise to be happy. I've also done that involuntarily. I've done that experiment because of like illnesses or injuries or whatever. And that bad feeling when I stop exercising, it doesn't go away. It doesn't go away after a few days or a few weeks. It stays with me until I get back into my routine. So I think that's how you find out is you try going without. And once you push through those first few days that are never going to feel great, does that discomfort go away? And if it does, then like, well, you probably didn't need that thing then. If that discomfort does not go away, then that is maybe just a genuine part of who you are and it's a need you should continue to meet. Yeah, I think as well, like it's um, the time frame is so funny. It's so tricky as well, because there's certain things like that take weeks or, you know, days, like you said, like certain things will just take a couple of days. Like I was like you, I, I'm very, I was a big gamer my whole life. Like anime and video games were like my two things I ran on, man. And I still do like, um, I'll watch, I'll watch the odd anime still for sure. But mm-hmm. like, I've got like in my apartment here, since I've moved in, which was like probably two years ago, I've been in this apartment, like my PlayStation is sitting in a drawer. Like it's literally not even plugged in. <laughs> And like my Xbox has been turned on twice and it's to watch things on. So it's like, it's, I've got the system still, I've got everything available for me. And I just never, I literally never even think about it. But then there's other things like, um, like, like with weed, for example, like it's been weeks, but there's only certain triggers now that'll activate where it's like, Hey, this is the thing that we used to do before we did this, you know, like, especially like the, the get home from work kind of thing. Like, that it's like get home from work and it's like oh i have a couple hours before i have to do a podcast episode or i have a couple you know i've got like the evening to myself like maybe we should smoke pot and watch movies like there's still those weird triggers where it's been weeks and it's like knocking at the back door kind of thing you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and it's like maybe i don't have to answer it exactly Definitely, definitely kind of, uh, it feels like that as well. Are you, uh, I know it's, it's been over an hour and I know it's your weekend. Did you want to wrap this up pretty quick? Did you have any other closing thoughts, anything that you want to kind of chat about before we turn this off? No, I think we hit some good, yeah, I think we hit some good points. I probably should see what my family's up to, but no, I think we hit some really good key points here and hopefully a lot of your listeners can find some value in what we talked about today. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I appreciate your time, man. I appreciate you doing this on a weekend as well when you're off hours, man. The weekends are actually easier for me. My my workday schedule has no wiggle room in it whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, I, I love that, man. I think that it's uh, it's been a really good chat. And I like I said, I'm going to revisit that audio book. So for anyone that's listening to this, um, highly recommend it. I'll even I'm gonna, I'll probably put a link into it so people can just go and check out your book as well but I I know like I connect with it a lot and uh, yeah like I said like it's it's one of those books where it's not just like you need to do this I like the way you relate it to a lot of personal stories because that's that's what clicked with it for me but man I really appreciate your time today man I hope that you have a good weekend and I hope that everyone listening has a good week a good day good night if they're listening to this at night but thank you so much man Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Always good to catch up with you. And I suspect we'll probably do it again sometime. Oh, yeah, man. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you so much, man. Much love. Peace out. Thank you. Take care, Mark. You as well.